Hi, and welcome everybody to our How to Raise Mason Bees Q&A with Dave Hunter, the founder and owner of Crown Bees. So whether this is your first time raising Mason Bees or you're a seasoned beekeeper, um, we are excited to help answer your questions. So I just wanna go over a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, first, thanks so much to everyone that submitted questions ahead of time. We got a lot of really great questions and we'll do our best to get to all of them in the time that we have. We organized the questions um, to follow the Mason Bee season. So we're gonna start in the spring with getting your yard and garden ready for Mason Bees. Um, then we're gonna get into harvesting and then winter storage. If you have any additional questions, please make sure to type them in the chat box um, because Kylie is over there and she will be um, answering your questions in the chat. Um, one other thing that is new to this webinar, if you've been to one of our Q&As before, this will be new to you. We'll be utilizing um, QR codes throughout the Q&A to link to certain products or learning pages or programs that we're talking about. So if you have um, your phone ready, you can just go ahead and scan the codes as we speak and it'll take you directly to the page that we're talking about for more info. Um, but don't worry if you miss the QR code or you'd rather view it later, um, you'll be able to rewatch this recording on our uh, YouTube channel later today. So you can always just pause it and scan it then. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dave to get us started. Dave, are you ready? I'm all ready. There's a lot of great questions out there. And awesome. so actually how we're going to work this, um, Kim, you're going to ask the question and I'm going to respond sometimes, then sometimes Kim has the answer. So it'll be a back and forth. I'm ready. Yes. Okay, great. So our first question comes from uh, Washington um, and it says, I know there are three types of nesting materials for mason bees, reeds, cardboard tubes, and wood blocks. So is one better than the other? I am thinking about getting a new house with wood blocks, but I'm unsure if I will harvest cocoons or not. All right. Um, if you ask the bee what they prefer, uh, as a bee flies into a house, they've got these little cilia on top of their foreheads, they're called um, false eyes, and they know precisely where the front of the house is. Man, they can get just right there, all right? Past that, they're now, um, they're trying to choose which is their hole. When you're looking at reeds, every reed is unique. So super easy to find. They typically get there and fly right in. Uh, paper tubes that are kind of cattywampus, so B-tube and inserts, with, um, we think, using um, these little colored rosin or wayfinders kind of helps the bees find their way. Um, and then lastly, when you're using wood trays, um, this is probably a little harder for the bees to find. It's probably cheaper in the longer run because you're just doing this every single year, opening these things up. Um, this is why we burnish the fronts of the trays, so it gives a little 3D environment, so the wood grains are there. Uh, but you'll find actually the bees will do the bottom row first because that's easiest to find, and then they work their way up the sides, kind of making like a little smile. So uh, preference of bees would be reeds, paper tube and inserts, kind of cattywampus, and then trays. It's a great question. We have that asked all the time. Awesome. Um, so this is another question from Washington, um, and it talks about leafcutter bees, but that's okay because we are getting into leafcutter season as well as it warms up. So the question is, I've had leafcutter bees for two years, but most of the tubes in their bee houses don't open. How do I get the cocoons out without harming the bees? So this would work for mason bees as well. Right. Um, in the past, we've said, um, take a reed and pinch the tops and then you kind of pull them apart. We find that's not nearly as easy as a um, brand new little tool called the um, reed splitter. I'm grabbing the node end, here's the mud end, and here's the node end. I'm really just putting inside there, and as I do this, I'm able to crack the reed open quite readily, and it's just, you know, bam, here's all mason bee uh, cocoons inside there. So um, we think this is easiest. This can actually open up bamboo if you've got old style houses from China, they're glued in. You can break those bamboo pieces out and typically crack this as well. Uh, that would work well for leaf cutters or mason bees. And what happens if um, the house has 
um, like drilled blocks of wood or something that's not reeds that the reeds flare wouldn't work on. Um, we'll talk later on about why one harvests. There's just pests that show up inside these nesting holes that if this is, you know, our wood trays open up so you can get to everything. But if you had uh, no access to the inside of the holes, the bees will wind up um, leaving and then they'll reuse those same holes with pests inside there. And so, um, and we'll talk specifically about the Houdini fly later on. What we recommend is taking a bee guard bag and simply just putting um, your old nesting hole, the old house, the whole thing inside here. That as you're um, pulling this thing tight with the, um, I would have this just on your porch or on, you know, on someplace that as the bees emerge, you're going to see them and daily uh, open this thing up to let the bees out real easy. If you find pests that are coming out, you'll find Houdini flies. Um, you're able to just squish those inside the back. So this is um, successfully how to move it. And so uh, putting the old house in a bag, having a new house um, nearby is shifting bees from old to new. Awesome. Good question. Um, so this next question is from Cecilia from Washington. Um, they ask, what early spring flowers and flowering bushes can we plant that will provide food for our mason bees? So I'll actually take this question. Um, so being from Washington, some good options are uh, red currant, or sometimes it's called gooseberry. Um, maple trees are another one. Trillium is a great native um, early bloomer. Uh, Dogtooth violet. And then another thing that you can do is leave the dandelions um, in your yard. I know we sometimes think of them as weeds, but they're actually a really important um, source of pollen and nectar for our early um, pollinators. Um, and then, you know, we, we know all about mason bees and leafcutter bees, but we do have our friends at the Xerces Society and Pollinator Partnership. Let me just pop these up for you. So here is a QR code for the Xerces Society. Um, and then I'll pop Pollinator Partnership, Partnership up in a second. But both of these have really wonderful regional native planting guides that can help you because what you plant is really gonna be dependent on where you live. So both of these are really great resources to go and find, you know, what you should plant where, depending on where you are from. So definitely check out um, our friends at Pollinator Partnership and Xerces Society um, to get a better idea of what you can plant. So I'll leave that up for just a second. If I could just add to that, um, we're beginning to understand um, what necessarily uh, showy, so petunias and, and all these things that humans want to see as bright colors and maybe smelling beautiful aren't necessarily helpful for the bees. The pollen and nectar have just been bred out of them, hybridized out of them, and, and it's um, beautiful for us, useless to the bee. Um, so not saying don't have show in your yard, but as you're thinking about it, maybe a yard could have 50 to 60% showy and then useful um, scattered throughout there would be probably how the bees would want to prefer it. And um, as an aside, the dandelion, um, when the pilgrims brought the honeybees across back in the 1500s, 1600s, there wasn't any pollen on the east shores. So they brought the dandelion from um, Europe over here because it's such a great source of pollen. So useful, weedy, but that's where it came from. Great. So I've got a couple questions here from North Carolina. Um, so they say we are introducing solitary bees at an upcoming Earth Day event. So what is the simplest way to get families started on helping solitary bees by using materials that can be found around the house? Can I'll, I'll continue so you can answer them all at once. Can a bee nesting house be filled with just homemade paper tubes or are we potentially doing more harm than good using paper? Um, and then how important is it to have bee tubes that are at least six inches in length? Can it be longer? So okay, roll so all that in. <laughs> there's a lot. Um, to a bee that's nesting in a cavity, um, there are small bees that go in a four millimeter, like an eighth of an inch hole, medium and large bees. And the large bees are maybe using 
uh, five sixteenths and just a hair bigger, so like a nine millimeter Osmia bucephala is out on the East Coast. So if you're going to go out and cut your own holes from Japanese knotweed or whatever, or you're going to take paper tubes and wrap them around a dowel, um, a number two pencil is like a five sixteenths. Um, colored pencils are sometimes smaller and even coat hangers might get there. As you're wrapping, um, think through at least four wraps of paper. There are some pests, parasitic wasps, that try to get through the side walls of these things. And we think four wraps are um, better than anything. Um, the bigger the hole, probably the longer the length. So if you're doing um, at least six inches for most stuff, but if you're doing four millimeter holes, even like four inches would be just fine. Um, and as you're doing this, make sure you bend over the back part to tape it. So you've got um, something that you can, you know, maybe one little piece of tape holding as you wrapped it and then fold over the back part. I think that's fine. And um, these activities, um, when you're making your recycled something, you use an old pop bottles or, or anything you want, Having them colorful, you know, even taking um, markers and, and coloring the tips different colors adds just a variety of, of showy for the humans and might help the bees uh, find their way in there. So um, DIYs is a good thing and it's a good activity to get going. And um, when you're doing this, um, Kim does have a lot of um, put together some uh, how to's that if you're bringing a class into it, um, there's a lot of good information underneath our um, be knowledgeable pages that could help you teach why you're building these things. Okay. Right. Yeah, and um, I do have the DIY how to make a solitary bee house um, QR code up there. It's got lots of really great information and inspirational ideas. So definitely check that out if you're thinking of doing the DIY route. Um, our next question is refrigeration absolutely necessary? So to simplify for beginners, can the entire house be placed in an outdoor shed for the winter and then placed back outside in the spring? Um, so just quick physiology of how the spring bees of any variety um, overwinter. Out in the fall, so let's just say September, October, um, the bees have finally, they're fully developed bees now. They're shiny, their hairs are all there, and their wings are all fully formed. Their fuel tanks, their stored fats, and their abdomens are 100%. And so these bees survive through the winter on that fuel tank. And by the time spring comes around, an early spring bee, their fuel tanks might be 10% or something. And that says, ah, come out here. And every year, typically the plants are in sync with with the bees and so the plants will come out at the same time with the bees and so a later bee um, a may be osmia um, bucephala different species will come out later may and their fuel tanks you know last a little longer so that's that's what's going on if we see uh global warming occurring or climate change um, our plants are kind of out of whack a little bit and sometimes it's warmer during the winter and a warmer environment has the metabolism of the bees higher and they're actually consuming the fats much faster than they would had it been steadily cool through the whole winter. So by the time March or so when these bees are ready to come out, March or April, if their fuel tanks are down to zero, they're forced to come out weak and maybe earlier before the plants are there. And so um, it's I would prefer just letting nature take care of itself. But as we're walking through these climate messes by keeping them in a fridge your the bees they don't care where they're at okay their stored fats are longer you know it lasts longer and are you can hold your bees all the way through till late april you've got a very late spring this year for whatever reason you're able to hold your bees through till the end of april and so it's just it's a proactive piece um, in our company, we keep all of our bees at 34 degrees from October through, well, until we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to. I mean, you could put them in your shed and let nature take its course. Yeah, we have some some great resources. I didn't I didn't create a QR code for this, but if you go to our Bee Knowledgeable page and look under Mason Bees, um, if you're having an abnormally 
warm or cool spring, um, we do have resources there that you can check out um, to help you learn kind of what to do with your mason bees if you're having abnormal weather. Um, so check that out. Um, and another question also from North Carolina. Uh, we would like to rehabilitate a very large existing bee hotel in a town park that's made mainly of logs that have drilled holes in them. Can we replace the logs with new ones and still use drill holes, um, but use paper tubes that we can remove and replace annually? Um, to a bee, um, a pile of holes in one tight space is not normal. Um, back you know, millennia ago, your, your bees would go into maybe broken off reeds or old tree skags that would just be drilled into beetles, et cetera. So they'd find holes scattered on these trees and that's where they'd nest. When we put um, large scale, huge um, houses together, I think they're messaging boards first and, and useful, um, but more importantly is you're alerting walker buys in, in these parks that Ah, uh, look, here's bees that nest in holes. I think um, research actually shows that if you have any more than a couple hundred holes in one tight space, um, it's less bees will nest there, I think, because they can't find them all. Um, so if you've got something huge, I would put signage in a quarters of these things, kind of telling people what's going on. We've got some really cool QR codes that um, we've printed off that, you know, can tell people exactly what's going on. Um, I don't think we have that out there, Kim, but there's a QR code that is perfect for parks that would say that. So I might take some of my space and turn it into um, messaging a bit. And then um, there we go. Yeah. Um, that one we think uh, <clears throat> doesn't really advertise us. It just it really says here's what's going on, shows bees flying. I think it's a good um, universal piece for um, public gardens, botanicals, uh, community schools. We just think it's a good piece to go there. Um, and then back to logs or no logs. Um, I think logs with drilled holes, it's simple. Um, I think you're demonstrating what's going on. If um, I would, uh, in my piece, I might say, here's an example of logs in nature. And then we even have, um, here's also, you can do this too with, with wood trays reeds or paper tubes and just show it it's an example of education bees will nest in these things um will they nest in them i would hope so um and when it's something so huge just let it flow with nature let i wouldn't worry about harvesting or thing just let it flow okay um so this is a question from carol from california um they say i released mason bees in my garden two years ago and they are thriving Yay. Um, my problem now is I have them everywhere, especially all over my hummingbird feeders. I love having them and watching them thrive and I'm so grateful, but now I just want to live in harmony with everything else in my garden, especially the hummingbirds. Okay. So I missed so what you, do you suggest? You froze for a second, Kim. What was that first part? Oh, um, she released Mason bees in her garden two years ago. Mm -hmm. And now they are thriving and they are everywhere, um, including the hummingbird feeders. Okay. So she wants to live in harmony with both the bees and the hummingbirds. Any suggestions? Um, as the popularity of mason bees, leaf cutter bees becomes more and more um, in mainstream, um, our company can't raise enough bees. And if you're very successful raising these bees, uh, we would very much love to partner with you in our bee buyback program that we get bees from Tennessee and New York and Oregon, and Washington. Um, we get the mail to us in the fall. We clean them up. Uh, we're buying them from people for cash. We're giving you guys store credit. So this is kind of free for you. And then um, we clean up and hold them in bins here. And then we send these bees right back to those uh, eco regions, kind of like Iowa would be next to Ohio, we're, we're trying to keep the bees in the same place. So um, it's important for us to team with um, successful bee raisers. And um, it's, we'll work with you if you have too many bees. Um, there's nothing wrong with success in the backyard. Yeah, and I would also say, um, 
you know, mason bees being just like a gentle solitary pollinator, they're not really negatively impacting um, your hummingbirds. They may be stealing some of the hummingbird fluid, um, but they're not they're not going to be aggressive towards the hummingbirds at all. Oh, no. And, and if anything, they're just tasty little snacks for your hummingbirds. So, um, you know, nature eat or get eaten. So I, if if I had a bird feeder in my backyard, I might have it out of line of sight, maybe, or a distance away from the birds. Just um, I also, if I had bird feeders um, nearby, I would recommend putting a bird guard over the front. We do sell bird guards for all of our houses, or maybe a chicken wire or something. But I would uh, recommend um, the bees will come out in the morning and just sit there in the sun trying to warm up. And it's a, it's an easy thing for a bird to land on the front and just snack away. Part of nature. Circle of life. Yeah. 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 Circle of life. So here That's is a, another question out of North Carolina. I have quite a few North Carolina questions. Um, for families that grow summer vegetable and flower gardens, it would seem that spring mason bees, what, the pollinating season would be done. So should new tubes be placed in the bee house to attract other bees, such as leafcutter bees, to pollinate summer crops? And do these new new tubes need to be six millimeters in size? Um, to appreciate across the full country, there are all across the country, small, medium and large bees poking out all times of the year. Um, the spring mason bee that uses mud goes in a 5 16 so that's kind of found throughout the full country. There are a ton of other little, medium and large bees that just aren't um, as uh, popular yet. And so um, in June through bee mail, we'll tell you uh, once your one season is done, if no one's using the house quite there, you know, bee wise, to take those pieces out and then um, take those filled holes out, put them into a, a bee guard bag just for protection, and then leave out all sorts of sizes because there are um, bees that use tree resin, bees that use fluff from flowers, um, chewed up leaf bits, pebbles. There's parasitic wasps that are grabbing critters from your yard. Uh, solitary wasps are all beneficial. So, you know, there are all sorts of things that will um, go out there and use these holes. And what Kim put up here, um, what's this? Uh, there's a lot of different end caps that if you look at this specific uh, piece within our Be Knowledgeable page, um, this might give you a clue with who could be nesting in your house. Um, little pieces of grass are carried by some vespid wasp that grabs uh, hard stuff, uh, crickets, grasshoppers, lacewings, or other species will use um, uh, soft-sided critters, inchworms and stuff. It's, it's, it's a wonderful place to um, pull nature together. Yeah, that's great. And the, the next question is kind of another question about, you know, what could possibly be nesting in my bee house? So again, I would say, go check out this um, capped end guide. I'll, let me pop a picture up. Um, this is just kind of an overview of what it looks like, but you'll see the different diameters, what types of bee might be using that diameter, what the end caps may look like. Um, so this is a really great resource if you're just trying to learn what is in your bee house. So explore, yes. explore your yard, just let, let them show up. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be moving into questions on releasing mason bees. Um, so we've got quite a few questions about when and how to release your mason bees. So this one comes from Lori from Oregon. Uh, last year, our season was late, and this year we are still getting snow presently. I know that's the case for a lot of the East Coast right now. I know my family's from Wisconsin, and they just got another foot of snow, so um, it's kind of all over the place. So how do we get an updated estimate on a bee release for our area? I would track nature. Okay, so you're holding, if you've got your bees in a fridge or someplace cold, the bees don't know yet when it's spring. Okay, again, they're surviving on their stored fat, so we're trying to kind of work with this. If your winters are late, watch, you know, when the dandelions show up, your first fruit trees, maybe your plums or, or cherries, um, when these things are just starting to bud, 
um, around out here in Washington, um, I'm going to say um, my dandelions and my cherry trees give me the clue that ah, I should put my bees out. And if they're late, I have my bees in my fridge. I'm able to put them out a little later on. Um, it is frustrating sometimes when nature doesn't always work with our, you know, how we want it to. We've put out bees and then had it snow. Okay. Um, if you have a lot of cocoons, maybe hedge your bed and put some out early, early March, late March. Uh, wait a little bit so the weather kind of drops into a little more uh, normal somethings, and then put your bees out um, mid-April. So separating them by two to three to four weeks has your actually pollinators in your yard instead of just six weeks for a normal um, lifespan of a mason bee. By putting some out later, you've extended your life, your, your pollination window to maybe 10 to 12 weeks. I think we talk about releasing in a little bit, but that's, that's the idea. Yeah. And I would add to that. If you did, um, get bees on order, you pre-ordered bees, and then all of a sudden you're looking at the forecast and your bees are set to arrive in the middle of a blizzard. Um, you can change your bee ship date. We understand you can't predict the weather that far out. So um, the QR code that I popped up here, as long as it's you know seven days out, you can go ahead and change your bee ship date to make sure that it, they don't arrive in the middle of your snowstorm. Yeah, and even um, just going to our chat and just saying, hey, here's me and here's my name. Um, can you shift to the state? We're we're here to team with you. We want yep. you successful. Mm -hmm. So another um, question about bees hatching. So why did my mason bees hatch while in the refrigerator, and what should I do with them since spring has not arrived yet? And this question came from multiple people from Washington all the way to Vermont. So it's a it's happening across the country. What do we do? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little more physiology. In the summer. You know, so at the very beginning, you, the eggs were laid in the spring and the eggs consumed all the pollen. Uh, they began spinning cocoons in June and June through August, they're metamorphosing into adult bees. So they're finally ready by, let's just say October 1st, for the sake of argument, October 1st, and they're 100% fuel tanks and off they go. If your summers are warmer, okay, whoops, a lot warmer, um, they're going to race through the bees are using these heat uh, days btu days to go through their cycle and if it's um your bees are 10 degree experiencing 10 degrees you know hotter um temperatures they're going to race through and be maybe a hundred percent by september a month early and now all of a sudden they're at a hundred percent in september it's still warm uh, going in through october they're consuming through their stored fats really fast. So by the time October 1st hits, instead of being 100%, maybe they're at 70 or 80%. Oops. Okay, this is just global warming. So as they're now going through the season, even in the refrigerator, they're consuming their fats. The males will come out um, when they hit zero. I'm out. I'm in your fridge. I'm tapped out. And you can tell the males by having longer antennas and typically a white forehead or, or chin. Okay, so there's the males. The females will sit in your fridge. Um, they know that it's not warm enough yet, and they'll start absorbing their eggs. Typically, they have 25 to 30 eggs in their body, and they'll just absorb their eggs. And so um, you can actually keep your females in your refrigerator. We've done it by accident almost a full year, and they come out barren, but they're alive. Um, uh, so I would, in a fridge, when these bees have come out, it's typically the males. I would um, put a little um, half sugar water, just white table sugar water and half uh, regular water, mix it into a little bowl, um, put a sponge or a piece of cotton ball into your humidity with that. And that sustenance, that sugar water is, um, is a good life extending something. The bees will go in there and, and um, eat, eat that. You can probably extend, um, males by oh good two or three weeks um years ago as my company was in the garage someone unplugged one of our garages and we had tens of thousands of bees all out in february and it was just this big mess and so they, they were mostly males and we had what a mess put them into little little tupperware 
containers and turn it back into the fridge. And so at about, so I had tens of thousands of these males in these containers. And um, I didn't do anything. This is a long time ago. I didn't do anything for them. And by uh, March, I just grabbed a handful and threw them on my porch out there and they all flew away. So a month was fine. And then um, by April, I, I don't know, mid-April, I threw a handful out there and most of them flew away. And by the time the end of April, I, God, I didn't forget them, but we put a lot of them out there and a few of them flew away. So, <laughs> okay, they, they can survive in your fridge, but I would add that sugar water with them. And so life expectancy, a month maybe or more. And as soon as temps reach what they should, blossoms start coming out, out, release them as soon as possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Here is a question from Grace from Washington. Does the temperature have to be in the 50s both day and night before putting the uh, mason bee cocoons out? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, it is more um, rather than temperature, I would watch what's flowering, flowering in your yard. So um, it, the, the daytime temperature is what we're kind of playing. The bees, um, once they are emerged, they'll fly down at about 48 because they just kind of need to. Um, so they'll fly a lot cooler. I think honeybees show up around maybe 56, 57 degrees. They'll just sit in their hives waiting. So the mason bees will fly earlier, but if they're already out of their cocoons, they'll fly down to about 48. And, and um, I, I would watch, uh, so daytime temperature doesn't matter. And if it's freezing at night, it doesn't matter I mean, at all. Watch the flowers, they'll give you the clue. Great. Um, so here's a question about male to female ratio. How many females to males do I put out? And maybe for um, those that don't know how to tell the difference, you can explain a little bit about how to tell the difference between male and female cocoons. Okay. Um, so I just opened this read just a little bit ago and I, I know it's kind of tough to see, but on the, this is the where the mud was down here. So I'm on the back side of the reed. Um, the females know how far a bird can peck in from the end. And so the larger mounds of pollen were all laid back here on this side. Ah, there we go. Okay, so big cocoons are females and they'll gather a little bit of pollen for the males on the outside and little pollen equals a little bee will be the males. So inside bees, larger, females, outside bees, smaller males. And in general, two pieces are kind of there. If you weighed all of the males and you weighed all the females, the, the average weight's about the same. Um, but when you actually go count them, since there's smaller males, you're gonna find maybe uh, two females to three males-ish. And we find that's pretty consistent across um, your bee kingdoms, roughly two to three. So if you're going to be putting these out, um, we recommend actually just not trying to sort out females and males. Just take a pile of them and, and that in that pile, yeah, I've got both small and large, put those out. So just rather than counting, just kind of grab and play random would be more our two cents. Great. Um, and then you kind of answered this question about staggered release. So how many bees do I need to stagger cocoon release and how long do I wait between releases? But maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on those two. Yeah, I would um, at, at a minimum put 20 cocoons out. So if I had 60, I might go two waves of 30 roughly. Um, I think every other week would be a way to run it. So. Um, around in the Washington, Oregon area, I might be out um, latter March and then early to mid April. And then finally by April 30th, I'm putting them out. Um, or you could put a, a half of them out at the very beginning and then, a, you know, a quarter and a quarter, but three, you know, I, I would wing it, um, but at least maybe 20 per release. Um, here's a question from Alan from Texas. Is there an ideal population number for mason bees? Um, and is it calculated on a per acre basis? So for example, we have five acres um, in the Texas Hill Country with native post oaks and plan to add wildflowers, fruit trees, and vegetable gardens. How many mason bees would I need? 
you know, the answer is um, it depends upon the flower load. Your bees are flying in a six acre radius, a 300 foot radius is, is about roughly six acres. They're taking pollen from everything. Each bee needs about a square yard, a square meter of, of pollen per day, per cell. Okay. That's out there in six acres. Um, around here where there's a lot of pollen and it's, <clears throat> it, there's a lot of pollen around my area. I can run in my yard. I've got these huge big leaf maples, just mass amounts of pollen on my hillside. I can run two to three, 5,000 bees and they're just flowing back and forth. But the minute those big leaf maples stop blooming, my yard can only support about two to 300 roadies or whatever else is out there. So it just kind of depends upon the load of pollen there. I would always, um, I think you'll find, I typically would start with an order or two of bees, masons or leaves, and just see how they do. And after a while, you're going to find that they're going to balance out at some, um, if you got an awful lot of pollen in your yard, you're going to wind up with too many and, and join us in the bee buyback. If you keep on just kind of maxing out at 100 bees per year, then that your yard says, well, not that. Okay. I hope it answered it. Wing it. Hopefully. And if you do any, if anyone has any more questions or would like, um, you know, a little more insight, just please feel free to fill out a ticket um, on our website and ask us our, just ask us. We will get back yeah. to you. And actually, on if you're on a, more of a commercial side, when we're playing with uh, full orchards, so 110 mature cherry trees in an orchard, we're putting 1,000 cocoons per acre. And apples, maybe four or so hundred. And when we're out in, in a full acre of strawberries, maybe 300. So there's depends upon the flower load. You know, a flat something has less pollen than a big mature 12 foot tree. So those. Um, those are rough numbers for on the commercial side of things. Great. Okay, so um, we have a question about mud. So how deep of a hole do I dig for placing the clay rich mud? Um, so just so we're all on the same page, mason bees use mud to um, build the, the walls between um, where they lay their eggs and then cap their nests. So um, that's why they're named mason bees. So they do need mud and it not all mud is created equal. So it does need to have a higher clay content um, for it to be able to pack and harden and protect the bees. Um, so if you have clay rich mud in your yard, awesome, but not everyone does. So if you need to add um, mud, you can do so. We sell both mud and a um, mason bee mud box, which I will pop that up. Um, this is just for really arid land that, you know, it dries up quickly. The mud box help keeps, helps to keep it moist longer. Um, but back to the question is about six to eight inches is plenty deep. It doesn't need to be super deep. Um, and you will want to add the mixture to the southernmost sidewall to prevent it from drying out. Um, and then as far as placement in your yard goes, you'll also want to make sure that the mud is within 10 to 20 feet of your bee house but not directly underneath the bee house because it's not natural for bees to fly straight up and down. Um, you know, they fly out. So you want to put it within 10 and 20 feet. So close by, but not right underneath. Um, and that's it. That's all you need to do. And um, just remember to check it every once in a while. If you've had like a big rainstorm to make sure it's not flooded or if it's been a while since you've seen rain, um, just to make sure it hasn't dried out. And if it has, you can just add some more water. Yeah, and to finish that one, Kim, um, if you were to take a bee that uses cactus pulp and bring it out to someplace up in, in Minnesota, you're going to find that cactus pulp using bee not doing mom flying someplace else. Equally, if you take a clay, you know, a clay using bee in an area that doesn't have clay, you've got um, lawn and, and roof and asphalt you'll find your bees fly away. It is a night and day statement. A clay rich using bee needs it or they're going to fly. Yeah. Um, okay. So I've got a couple questions here about parasitic wasps, um, one from Illinois and one from Minnesota. Um, so one of the question is, 
what I usually try to kill the ones I see, and it seems like another group just move in the next day. So any advice to keep the critters at bay? Um, and then the other one is I've had success using the mesh bags, so bee guard bags, but when do I remove the bag? Okay. Um, the a parasitic wasp for the mason bee typically goes through the side wall of too thin, uh, like if you only just put out the inserts or you put out just the bee tube itself, that's not thick enough. And these little parasitic wasps um, use their antennas and they tap on the, their feeling vibrations. They tap to see where there's a, a um, larva down there and they'll stop and put their ovipositor right through the side wall of the um, of your nest hole okay so if these are too thin only insert only b tube or you did your own you only rolled a couple little rolls around there the parasitic gloss can get right through okay uh, so to counteract that um, reads b tube and insert and we learned um i've been doing this a long time and only about maybe six years ago we realized that um on the back side of these trays, we didn't have um, our pest blocker. We had just the, we just had just this um, uh, cardboard backing, and and those stupid. Um, we'd have piles of these trays in our in our office, and all of those uh, wasps would get down behind the tray and just have access to all of the females on the back side. What a mess! And so um, this little. Um, um, what do we call this thing? Uh, our bee pest, pest, pest blocker. There we go. Um, belongs on the backside of the trace. And once you put this there, this pretty much uh, stops the parasitic wasp from doing any damage. So that. And then with regard to your um, uh, bee guard bag, I would keep that in your. Um, I would keep your nesting materials in that all the way through the summer. Um, uh, as an aside, check on it. We do find um, there are some species, I don't know whose, uh, could be wasps maybe, will come in and use them um, early. And then um, five or six weeks later, will come out and, and be stuck in this bag because they, you know, their life cycle is maybe multiple generations in a, in a year. And you'll wind up with a lot of dead somethings in your bag. So just be aware with what's there once they, once they finished or keeping these maybe in a shed or something like that, but just be a little aware of what's what you've got in there. But it does keep, you know, it does keep pests from getting to them. Okay. Um, this next question is a good one. It is from Kim from Oregon. Um, and they say, I'm going to plant two avocado trees in my new greenhouse. They need to be pollinated early spring. I'm thinking of putting a bee house on the southeast side of the greenhouse and opening the windows when the trees flower. Will the bees fly inside to visit the flowers? And can I put a bee house in the greenhouse when the flowers are ready? So that is a good question. Um, Kim, I will, I will try and answer that one for you. The short answer is yes. Um, researchers have found some success using mason and leafcutter bees in greenhouses, um, but it is tricky. So we have an article, let me pop that up quick for you. So we do have an article that has more details um, than we have time to discuss in this Q and A, um, but mason bee, for mason bees, there's usually five things you need to consider. Um, so the first one is that you don't have any UV blocking shields on your greenhouses. Some greenhouses do have that, um, but bees use polarized light to find flowers and navigate back to their nests. So if you block that, they're just gonna be confused and they're not gonna do well in your greenhouse. Um, if you allow the bees to come and go through open windows, um, they're likely just going to go and not come back. So if you do want them in your greenhouse, you're going to have to put some sort of netting um, to prevent the, bee, the bees from flying out, but also to get airflow in. Um, you also need to make sure you have plenty of pollen and nectar inside the greenhouse. Um, mason bees, a single bee can visit 2,000 flowers a day, um, so you need to make sure that you've got enough pollen and nectar in that bee house or in that greenhouse for the bees to thrive. Um, and then also temperature is a big deal. So mason bees usually fly between 
55 and 80 degrees. So if it's warmer than 80 degrees, um, it's likely too hot and humid for mason bees. And you might want to consider maybe leaf cutter bees for your greenhouse. But that's really um, up to you to decide, you know, what is the average temperature of your house. Um, and then back to mud, you need to make sure that you've got a mud source in there as well um, so that they can efficiently nest. So it may take a little trial and error on your part to find out what works for your greenhouse, um, but it can be done. So definitely check out that, um, that article because we've got a lot more info on there when it comes to bees and greenhouses. So anything to add to that, Dave? I think it's fair. Um, but she also had the, she was thinking about putting the bees house outside. Would they go through the window? Yes, they should. Um, as long as um, it's that UV, they use those three little um, things on top of their head that if they can't, if it's blocked by something, then they just, um, it confuses them. They don't know where they're at. And so yeah. um, that's probably one of the critical pieces. Yep. But if there's anything, I mean, if there's plenty of pollen and nectar outside, they may not go in. Um, they are on a circuit. If it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, I would always say experiment. All right, so a question from Mike from Wisconsin. I've successfully raised mason bees in Milwaukee for about three years. Two years ago, something got into the nesting box and dislodged some of the tubes. Now the bees no longer want to nest there. They choose to nest in the cracks of a nearby wood telephone pole and the cracks in a wood timber wall around the garden, but not the bee house. How do I get the bees back in my nesting box? Okay, first of all, Congratulations. You know, they are there in your yard. So your yard is awesome for them. Um, besides putting little signs up, you know, in bee languages say nest here, it's like me. Um, the most attractive hole that they'll find is a reed. So having uh, reeds uh, in a spot um, is going to be helpful. We've, we've learned that you, you have two identical bee houses and they're both full of reeds left and right. Maybe there's, you know, 50 meters apart, 50 feet apart, okay? If all of the bees emerge from their cocoons over here and a first bee uses this house over here, then most of the, most of the bees will go to that, you know, will go to that other house. They just do. Um, they're gregarious, they wanna to nest to each other. So um, it's encouraging that the bees are nesting there time and time again, um, put something attractive and, um, I, uh, the, the, actually the Mason be attracted also, um, our invited bee is a, is a good piece. Good call, Kim. Um, it smells like bees have nested here before and downwind pheromones will pull bees into that spot. Good call. Okay. Um, I just looked at the time, Dave, so we are That's coming up on an hour, so we're going to have to, um, go maybe through a couple of these. Yep. I definitely want to, so this is not necessarily a question, but it's good to hear. Um, Herb from Washington, be sh Herb, sorry. <laughs> be sure to cover the trick to cut open the remaining cocoons that did not hatch. Um, so he's had about a 75% success rate in getting those bees to hatch in that way. Um, for those of us that don't know, could you please explain um, what he means and could you show us this trick? Okay. So I've got, um, we've got a, if you go actually do a Google search for crown bees, open cocoons, you'll find this me on a kitchen counter. It, but I'm it's taking, also, you can scan this QR code and it's there in you go. Right, right, exactly it. Um, but just real quick, like this is um, a bee, there's a, a pointed end and a not pointed end, that little nipple end, as the larva was um, finished its cocoon, it stretches out and makes it just a little pointy. So that's, I know where the female head is. This is a large cocoon. Um, I'm just going to take a pair of sharp scissors and just nip. Uh, so I'm not, I'm trying to be careful to not, I don't want to cut off her antennas and I've done this in the past. Um, but it's a very simple thing that I'm able to just kind of move around the cocoon. And so now all of a sudden I've got a live bee that's coming out on my finger. Okay. So it's just a very simple, um, uh, piece to do and she's I'll let her out when we're done here but um it's a very simple thing um you could go survival the fit is to say ah if they don't open then they shouldn't be here 
I, I would say it's more of us playing with um, global warming. I would let in, in the late spring, like May 1st, I would open up as many cocoons as you feel fit and put the bees directly onto a sponge filled with um, that sugar water or a bunch of dandelions. And the bees will just sit there and refuel and then go. Thank you. And yes, that in our video library, there is a, a video of that if you want to watch it again and pause it if you need to. Um, the next questions, we've had quite a few questions about the Houdini fly. Um, so before I get into the questions, I just want you to explain um, what the Houdini fly is and then kind of show some pictures of adults and larvae so you know what to look for. Okay, so it is a fruit fly. It's very small, big old red eyes, and it just basically sits on the outside of your house, the outside of the nesting holes, waits for the bees to um, go down there and lay their eggs inside the, um, their egg inside the pollen mass. And as the bee leaves, this fly is just down there laying its egg. Each fly owns its own hole, and they're perfectly in line with, um, synchronized with our bee. Uh, the reason we're kind of excited about this in a very negative way, it's a European pest that someone from Europe, we think England, sent a filled tube full of bees and this Houdini fly. And whether it landed in BC, British Columbia, or the Seattle area, it's now found um, people keep on spreading, just sending across the country uh, their unopened uh, tubes. And so uh, we find this in Connecticut and Jersey and it, it's, it's Pennsylvania, New York. It's all, all in Bremerton through uh, Bellingham and the Seattle area. It's all through BC and it's now spreading through Portland. It's a mess. And predominantly, what, does it, hmm? what does it do to the mason bees? Ah, all it's doing, could you show the maggots picture of that? There we go. Um, as it lays its eggs in this pollen mass and the mason bee sealed it inside that mud chamber, the eggs hatch first, they consume all the pollen. The mason bee egg is either kind of uh, nipped and dies or doesn't have any um, food at all. And so these maggots stay in that chamber all, all summer long as a maggot. Um, and in the fall as you're harvesting, here's what it looks like. They're just, that brown stuff is the frass, their poop. And these guys just, um, the flies will just wipe out your bees. And there's no known predator for this yet. Okay, it's, it's a mess. And so we're um, very nicely got the attention of the USDA your, and your taxpayer dollars are actually, uh, we're gonna be teaming with them to see if we can this season or next find an attractant for a sticky something or a D, you know, uh, detractant that would have them, repellent that would have them move away. So to handle this, Harvest, even now, just open things up if you can, okay? If you can't open things up, shift into the bee guard bag and you can let the um, bees out and smush the flies. And then um, proactively during the spring, as you're, if you find a fly sitting near the front, they don't move in the morning, just smush them with your finger. Or later on in the day, you're using a vacuum cleaner, just sucking them out of the air. Um, I think if you do this daily for a bit, you're going to lessen the impact. Um, if you do nothing, unfortunately, your neighbors are the ones that are giving you the fly. So it's um, it's kind of talking this with your friends, and it's a it's a it's very much in the West Coast, and it's just going to be spreading across the country. Mm -hmm. So in so, so this time of year in the spring is when you're going to want to look for these adult flies, and like Dave said, they're very slow. Um, and just kind of hover there. They're pretty easy to squish. Um, you'll often find them just sitting on the outside waiting um, for the, the adults to leave. Um, so don't get discouraged if you squish a bunch and then you come out like a few hours later and there's Half more hours. like, mm -hmm. unfortunately that is, that is what's happening, but we do have people working on it um, and anything is better than nothing like Dave said. So. And then in the fall, one of the best things you can do, and this is why we push harvesting so much, is because this is what can happen. These all used to be mason bees, um, and now it is all Houdini fly. Um, but, you know, if you harvest in the fall, you can just toss all of these maggots away. And then in the spring, when your bees hatch, 
these guys aren't going to be hatching along with them. So that's why harvesting is so very important um, to help stop the spread of pests. Okay, and when you say toss away, we really think you should put them in a Ziploc bag or something and seal them because if yeah. they get out in the waste stream somehow, if you if you compost them, if, if the ants didn't get them, they're just going to be emerging from your um, mm -hmm. compost pile. So if, if you have dogs, I use a dog poop bag. It works great. Thanks. Kim. No problem. Um, OK, and then moving into harvesting, we're going to for those of you that just planned for an hour, um, we're glad that you were able to join us, but we're going to go until we answer the rest of these questions. So if you've got time, feel free to stick around with us. Um, otherwise, this will be posted on YouTube so you can go and rewatch it um, or see what you missed. So thank you for joining us if you have to go. Um, and if you've got time, stick around because we are moving into our final questions, which are all about harvesting. So I have got a question from Pennsylvania. So at the end of the season last year, I noticed that my mudcap tube suddenly had holes in all the ends. I assumed they were invaded by parasitic, parasitic insects of some sort. Um, is this what happened and what do I do? Um, appreciate that we have a pile of food aggregated in one space. This isn't natural. Uh, we'll find carpet beetles. We'll, uh, we'll be destructive and we'll go into and kind of push the ends out and just kind of go through and just tunnel right through uh, carpet beetles in a larval form will do this uh, the meal moth goes right through from one to the next um by putting these inside a bee guard bag up front when the bees are done i think you're more likely to miss them um uh, i would be aware again once a month kind of go and check it out if you notice also these little holes um showing up you know <laughs> Ooh, um, maybe take all of your um, filled ones, capped ones, and put them in a different bag. Um, it, it, it's being aware. And sometimes the last part of the hole that the bee uh, filled up was um, the middle of it. And sometimes that dries out. It's kind of thin. It might have dried out. It might have just fallen out. So, you know, one or two little holes that dropped out isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if all of them, then there's something going on. Great. Um, here's a question from Jennifer from Michigan. Um, I didn't harvest cocoons in the fall, but I think that some of my reeds may have mites in them. Can I still harvest cocoons and clean them since it's still cold where I live? And that, I would, I've got another question very similar um, from Oregon. So is it too late to harvest and clean mason bee cocoons? Uh, no, not too hard. And um, you can probably avoid maybe washing things, but just to separate things out. So you've got um, bees and, you know, Everything I had inside this little pile here, there's there one of these little chambers is all full of pollen mites right there. I'm just kind of separating those things out. Um, I think it's very easy to do and I wouldn't necessarily wash them. When you wash a cocoon, 